Okay, here in this video I will show a few properties of particularly sigma additive measures uh, and I'll prove them and the proof actually shows you a few basic standard techniques uh, which you have to know when you work with sigma additive measures. So the result which I'm going to prove is this. Imagine I have a measure uh, on a ring. This is a ring. Uh, and then for such measure, the following three properties are equivalent. First one says that the measure is sigma additive. We have a sequence of decreasing subsets of your ring. And uh, if you set A to be the intersection of this sequence, then the limit of individual measures of an actually exist. This identity says that the limit exists and equal to the measure of this a. Of course, this is subject to the condition that this intersection belongs to the ring. In general, of course, countable intersection does not need to be in the ring. But if it is, then this is true. Again, limit exists, that's a statement, and it's, it, it equals to m of a. Uh, the, this property actually sometimes is referred to as upper semi-continuity. <laughs> Uh, and the third property, which is equivalent to the first two, is the lower semi-continuity. Lower semi-continuity. Let me just... Lower semi-continuity, property number three. And it says if you have increasing sequence of elements of your ring, and if you set... Uh, a to be the countable intersection of this sequence again subject to the condition that this intersection uh, sorry union I said intersection I meant union countable union of the of this sequence subject to the condition that this union is the member of your ring then again you have the limit like so and again this identity in particular states that limit exists and it equals to m of a all right, so when we're going to prove this, we'll prove that 1 implies 2, then 2 implies 3, and then 3 implies back 1. That's a typical way, very standard way, how you prove equivalence of a series of statements. So you do sort of a cyclic, <coughs> cyclic implication. So first we will look at the statement that condition 1 or statement 1 implies statement 2. So we assume that we have a measure, we see sigma additive, we assume that we have this decreasing sequence, of subsets. We assume that the intersection of such sequence is an element of the ring and we will show that this limit exists and it equals to m of a. Let's just do that. I'll do this by introducing these new sets which I call b sub n which will be the set difference between a n and a n take 1 and a plus 1 because the ring is closed under set difference, this is the, these are the elements of my ring, and that is for every n from 1 to n. the rest. Now what I claim is, what I claim is, is actually that the, the set A1, then, is the disjoint union of the set A, this set A, and all of these Bn's. Uh, actually, uh, I put here the short uh, argument which actually shows this. So look what we're going to do. We just take the element from the left hand side. So we take the element from the set A1. For such an element, we have for such an element we have two possibilities. Either there is an n such that x still belongs to A sub n, but it no longer belongs to the next one x n x doesn't belong to the a n plus 1. There is either this possibility or the other possibility is that x belongs to all a n's for all n's. Again, if x comes from a1, because a1 is the largest out of all of these sets, you just check if x belongs to a2, then you check if it, if it does, then you check that if a, x belongs to a3, if it does, you check the next one. And now the first time, first time where it fails, where x belongs to the a n, but it doesn't belong to the 
next one it's one possibility which may happen the other possibility you will never find such a where, uh, which which is missing the element x so we have two these alternative and alternative possibilities which covers all possibilities and these possibilities they correspond to either this disjoint this disjoint union or this element a right because if x belongs to every a sub n it means that x belongs to the set a the intersection of a sub n in this case it means that x belongs to the set difference a n set difference a n plus one which means x belongs to the corresponding bn it means that x belongs here so in fact we just showed to you i just showed to you that left hand side it means that x belongs to Altogether, we just saw that this means that x belongs to the right hand side so we started with the x in the left hand side we concluded that x belongs to the right hand side which is it means that we concluded this inclusion in fact all of this can be reversed because for instance x belongs to a in fact if and only if x belongs to all, or all of this so if x comes from here if x comes from here in particular x will be in a1 so you on the other hand, if x comes from here, from one of the bn's, again, you can reverse this, and again, it means that x will belong to one of the an's. And because each of these an's are a subset of a1, x will be again a member of a1. So, in fact, if you just start from this assumption, if you start from the assumption x comes from the right hand side, you can reverse this implication. And you reverse this implication, and you end up with the opposite embedding. The right hand side is also a subset of the left hand side. These two together, in fact, shows you that left hand side equals to the right hand side. Right, so having this identity now, having this identity, we can now conclude uh, the following thing. Uh, because my measure, remember, we're just showing this implication from 1 to 2, because measure is assumed to be sigma additive, and here we have a countable union, countable disjoint, disjoint union of elements of R, such that the resulting set is also element of R. This is the, this is the precise setting for the sigma additivity. So what we can say now is the measure of the left-hand side is the sum of the individual measures on the, on the right hand side. So it is measure of A plus the sum of measures of BN. Now this individual, now we can actually rearrange this. We can just now express this M of A in terms of the rest of the identity. So we have M of A actually, M of A1 take. And this time, uh, you see what I will do, what I, do, what I did. I just replaced the this symbol for the summation, infinite summation series, with what, with what we actually mean under this symbol. We mean that actually this infinite sum is the limit of finite partial sums. And in fact, when you write this, you say that this sum is in fact converges, which in limit terms means that this limit exists. Now, we'll look at this partial sum now closely. Let me just put it up a little bit. We look at this partial sum closely. Look at this. If I now replace what the BN was, and that would put is what was BN, then I will have oops. Then I will have sum of measures of these set differences. Uh, because according to the assumption, according to, this, to the assumption A n plus one was a subset of A n, and for such a uh, couple of sets, we know that the measure of a set difference is the difference of individual measures. That's what it said here. Now, when you look at this sum, this sum is a typical example of what people sometimes call telescopic sum, because if I just, if I write this sum, if I just write a few terms of this sum, look at this. The first term of this sum, for little n equal 1, it is this one. The second term of this sum, for the little n equal 2, is this one. I put the dots to conceal the other terms. I'll still probably show you the last term. The last term, when little n equal to capital N, 
is this term. If you look closely at this expansion, you will see that actually this one will cancel this. This will be cancelled by the plus m of a3 here. This will be cancelled by the negative m of a n capital here. And all would, what will be left after you cancel all of these intermediate terms will be the very first one and the very last one. So that's the reason why this sum is called telescopic sum, because it collapses like a telescope like a sections of a telescope, and all, the, what, all what is left is the first one and the last one. So that's the expression which is left for this partial sum, or for this partial sum. Now if, you, if I sub it back in here, then I have m of a equal to a limit. Well, there's a bit of a typo here. Uh, if I sub it back in here, this m a1 will cancel this m a1, this negative, with this negative, make it plus, and of course there's a typo here. Here must be capital M. And that's exactly what is claimed in the part 2. Let me just put it down a little bit so you can see that. Yes, here it is. So part 2 is established. <laughs> now we can show the, that 2 implies 3. So let me just move it up. Here, we now show 2 implies 3. So now we start with a sequence of growing subsets from your from my ring. We assume that the we have the uh, we, we do have the intersection, but we assume that this sorry union we do have the union, but we assume that the union is also the element of my ring. And now we have to see that the the limit of this individual measures equal to the this a. Look how we're going to do that. Again, we introduce some auxiliary sets. This time, this will be these sets, Bn, which is the A, take An. Remember, A is the largest set. It contains all of this sequence in it, because it's the union of, of those. So it's the element, element of my ring for every n from 1 to 3. What's interesting about this Bn is, in fact, is that actually B ends. It's a decreasing sequence, because uh, this one grows. And you, every time you subtract large and larger sets, so the remaining part will be smaller and smaller. This is sort of informal justification for that. Uh, formally, I'll let you to think about this independently. More interestingly, actually, that if you take the infinite intersection of Bn's, you will end up with the empty set. This is a, a little bit harder to see, but again, it's, it's a sort of a straightforward observation. Um, <clears throat> because if you... I don't have the argument. I don't have the pre-typed argument for that. I'll probably leave it for you to think about. Uh, you probably should, you, I suggest you think in the following... Uh, in, the, uh, following the, uh, uh, in the following lines, uh, lines of thought, uh, you imagine you, uh, you just assume the contrary, you take the element from this intersection, so the element which belongs to every Pn, which means it belongs to every set difference like this, but belonging to a set difference means that the element belongs to the A, but doesn't belong to this. So you have an element which belongs to every such bn, it, it means it belongs to a n, and it doesn't belong to every a n. And that's the contradiction, because if it doesn't belong to every a n, it cannot possibly belong to a, which is the union of such a n's. Right, so if you believe in this identity now, we can, we can use the part 2, right? Because part 2 says if you have a decreasing, uh, decreasing sequence of subsets, elements of your ring, if you have the intersection of these subsets, belonging to the ring, and that's the empty set, obviously belong to the ring, then the measure of this empty set, which is zero, by the way, is the limit of the individual measures Bn. But Bn, remember, the An is a subset of A, so Bn is just a difference. The measure of Bn is a difference of measure of A and measure of N. So if you, this is a constant, independent of N. If you take it out of the limit, if you rearrange the terms, if you take it out of the limit and if you re re rearrange the terms, we will you will end up with the with the what is required the limit of this measure, this sequence of numbers equal to this number. And that's how we see this implication. Now finally we have to see this implication. Three implies one. Remember three. Uh, actually I repeat it here. So we have a sequence of elements in Rn for every 1, 2, and n. No, I have to correct myself. Um, again, we have to see that 
3 implies 1. 3, 1, it's the sigma additivity of the measure, right? So we start with the sequence of elements of my ring. We assume that they are pairwise disjoint, and we assume that the union, disjoint union of these elements is a member of the member of the ring, our job is to show that the measure of A will be sum of the individual measures of A n. That's the sigma additivity of measure. And we have to use the property free for that. Now again I'll I'll take a auxiliary sets. This time will be it will be this collection of sets. I will be taking partial unions from one to n. Again because the ring is closed on the union, they will be the member of my ring for every n, one to two. Uh, what's more interesting, actually, that this will be the growing sequence of elements of my ring, because every time you add up extra element, extra A, so your set's growing. Also, uh, I'll observe that actually the union of these BNs will deliver the same set as the disjoint union of the original A case. Uh, this is a little bit harder to see, but it is rather doable, and you can. I'll leave it for you to think about. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it for you to think about this, this how to see this set identity. In fact, uh, by now you probably realized lots of the argument involving measures, uh, yeah, lots of the arguments involving measures are based on set identities, and uh, so you have to be, you have to train yourself to be able to s predict and prove those set identities. Sometimes, actually, I gave you some ideas how to do that. Sometimes I'll leave it for you to, for practice. This will be a good practice. Now, look what we, can, what we can do now. We just start now with the measure of my disjoint union. Remember, the disjoint union is the also the union of this, of this growing sequence of BNs. So it is my sort of a B set. And we know, according to the part 3, the limit, uh, the, the measure of this Union is the limit of the measures of these individual BNs. That's what it said here. That's that's this is the this is the identity which comes from, from part three. Now these BNs individually they are by themselves they are disjoint unions. And but they are finite disjoint unions, so we can use the fact that M is additive function. It's not well we, we establishing it is sigma additive, but we can use the fact that it is additive for finite unions. So if I use this fact, I can use this here, then I will have this expression. I replace this measure with the sum of the individual measures, finite sum. This is the partial sum of a series, and this is the limit. So in fact, this is just the, infinite, the sum of the infinite series. And that's exactly the sigma additivity. Look at this. We started with the sequence of ANs, which is which is a pairwise disjoint sequence. We assume that the union, countable union, the joint union of this sequence is a member of RN, and we show that the measure of this union equal to the sum series, sum of the series of individual measures. That concludes the proof of this property.